So let's get started. I want to welcome you. Uh, I'm Mark Alstrom, President of the ESIG Board of Directors and VP of Renewable Energy Policy for NextEra Energy Resources. And it's my great honor to welcome you to the 2024 Meteorology and Markets Workshop. 20 years ago, I was running a small company called WindLogix that was applying meteorology to wind projects. And I started attending Charlie's Utility Wind Integration Group uh, workshops to learn about what people were doing with, with wind projects and, and how wind forecasting was going to be used in operations. Uh, UWIG has been around since 1989 and it's now the Energy Systems Integration Group, but this workshop was first held in 2008. So this is our 17th forecasting workshop. Some of you were speakers at that workshop in February of 2008, including John Zach, Craig Collier, Pascal Stork, and, and Matt Sugar, who are here today. Uh, and yes, it was a very cold week in St. Paul, and I heard a lot about it. Uh, so I'll have no sympathy whatsoever if you complain about the heat here this week in Salt Lake City, okay? Uh, but I also see a lot of new faces here. Uh, how many of you are, are here for your first ESIG meeting, your first workshop? Wow, excellent. Glad to see you here. Uh, you know, uh, many of us here are science, weather, and engineering nerds. We can tend to be a bit introverted, but let's do our best to uh, do an imitation of being extrovert, extroverts this week and meet as many people as you can at the breaks and at the reception. This is a great opportunity to, to really get to know a lot of the, the thought leaders and, and interesting people around this, this application of what we're doing to really cleaning up the power sector more globally for, for society. So it's a big deal. So what is ESIG all about, if you're new here? Uh, you know, I found ESIG to be a very unique, useful, and necessary organization. Uh, ESIG is a global member-based nonprofit organization for those of us supporting uh, the technical aspects of grid transformation and energy systems. And we do this through workshops, tutorials, webinars, blogs, working groups, and task forces for our members, and by producing technical resource materials and briefing materials for all of you and for decision makers. We're not an advocate, we're, but we're trying to produce kind of the, the accepted technical best practice pathways forward, how we have to coordinate on getting things done. And it's a very important role. ESIG also serves as a leadership role in the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, often called GPST, working to support a global clean energy transition. ESIG convenes key participants to chart the technical pathways in a collaborative, reliable, economic, trusted, and sustainable way. And as you'll see this week, by bringing talented and dedicated people together at the right time to talk about the right things, ESIG is a catalyst to make progress faster and better. And that's why you participate and why most of your organizations are members of ESIG. That's why NextEra Energy Resources and Polaris System Optimization contribute at a sustaining member level to support the ESIG mission and why Analytics, Siemens, and WEG are sponsors of our workshop here this week. And I, I thank all of them for that. So it's also why the US Department of Energy supports the unique work of ESIG and why other donors who see the benefits of technical collaboration for grid transformation and energy decarbonization also support ESIG. And that's why your membership and participation in ESIG are so important. We're all involved in crafting the technical and engineering responses that are needed for our industry and our society. The primary source of support for making all this possible is your memberships. And I thank you if your organization is a member and strongly encourage you to consider joining if you're not currently a member. The modest annual membership fee is based on the annual budget of your organization. And if your organization is a member, then all of your staff are members. Uh, ESIG uh, independent consultants, by the way, and also and individuals can also join. And ESIG provides free memberships to students of accredited educational organizations. ESIG is a great place to learn and share your expertise. And we all need to do whatever we can to bring talented people into this industry. We need them more than ever, and we need to get them working on the important issues. So let me just use my pulpit here to kick off a some topics and discussion for our workshop before we get into the main event. A uh, hot topic this year, as you all know, is artificial intelligence and the massive energy needs for training and using AI. And the applications, benefits, and risks of AI for the forecasting and the power sector in particular. 
some of us were doing some useful things with AI methods for many decades, uh, but on early computing platforms and without much data to work with. Today's methods, computing power and training data sets have been game changers. This comes with some risks and some, uh, some rewards and some major costs, but there's no putting the genie back in the bottle now. You know, we really have to figure out how we're going to use this in a productive and, and safe way. And it's appropriate that we're discussing AI here at the Meteorology and Markets Workshop because many of you have been active and early users of machine learning in AI methods for many years. Probably one of the most educated audiences around you know, for, this, for these topics. The additional clean energy needs of AI, however, are dramatic. The training of GPT-4 takes 50 times the energy needed to train GPT-3, right? Apple plans to move its iPhone Siri queries to use AI at a 10x increase in computing and energy needs for each query. There's serious talk about dedicating parts of the existing US nuclear fleet to the large hyperscale computing centers that will be needed and energy needs are likely to continue to grow exponentially. And all this is hitting us at a time in the energy sector where we're already under pressure to triple the rate of deployment of carbon-free electricity to achieve existing decarbonization targets in the face of many significant challenges. Renewable energy and storage development must ramp up dramatically for all of this and also for rapidly expanding cryptocurrency, green hydrogen, electrification, and carbon capture technologies that will all require additional energy. So we're entering a period of unprecedented load growth. At the same time, it certainly feels to those of us trying to build projects that uh, every energy project is getting more difficult to get in the ground. And as we discussed in detail, we'll discuss in detail in numerous other ESIG workshops and activities, we're also in the process of transforming how we plan and operate the power grid itself. So there's no shortage of interesting, challenging, and vital topics. In fact, I think the main conversation so far here is, you know, the pace just keeps expanding and expanding about all the, the important things we have to get done. But that's what we're here for. I think it's, it's really uh, important. Uh, there's never been a more important time for all of us to participate in ESIG workshops and task forces to help society deal with these critical challenges. And by being here this week, you are part of the solution. I thank you for being here. I hope you keep working in this space and I hope you keep participating at ESIG and contributing your talents. I really think it's an important thing that we're all doing for society, our children, our grandchildren, and, and really the world here. So thank you for being here. Now let's get started with the main event. Our keynote speaker is Melanie Fry, president and CEO of the Western Electricity Coordinating Council. The nonprofit corporation exists to ensure a reliable bulk electric system for the Western interconnection. Melanie created a framework for WEC's Invented Future Initiative and has shaped transformation within the organization. Prior to her current role, she served as Vice President of Reliability Planning and Performance Analysis, overseeing WEC's technical and, and analysis functions, including event analysis, situational awareness, reliability planning and assessments, performance assessments, and standards development. She also served as WEX Vice President of Shared Services, overseeing human resources, accounting and finance, information technology, project management, and administrative service functions and staff. She joined WEC in 2007 as Director of Human Resources, and before then spent several years at Pacificorp. So she's pretty much done it all. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Melanie. Sorry. Thank you very much for that kind welcome. And thank you, Mark, for reading the full bio. You remind me it's time to refresh that and shorten it. It's a little bit long. Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here today uh, as the WEC office is here in Salt Lake City. So it was a, a very uh, ideal opportunity to come and spend a few minutes with you. I also really want to thank ESIG for hosting this workshop and convening such a great group of technical experts to focus on many of the topics that Mark spent time talking about. 
um, as you said, there there has probably never been a time in our industry where there's so much change going on, and it really does require all the bright minds out there to solve those things. So I'm excited to talk to you today about inventing the future. As we look at the massive transformation that our industry is experiencing, this is a great opportunity to be part of shaping the future, and you're all part of that by being here. As Doc Brown says in one of my favorite movies from Back to the Future 3, anyone remember Back to the Future, 80s? Okay. I also read that if that movie was to be made today, the year they would go back to is 1994. So for those of us who remember 1994, it's kind of a, a, a trip. But, um, but what Doc Brown says at the end of Back to the Future 3 is, your future hasn't been written yet. Your future is whatever you want to make of it, so make it a good one. And I'll get back to that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, so welcome to Salt Lake City. Uh, Mark asked how many of you are coming to the eSig for the first time. I'm curious how many of you are coming to Salt Lake City for the first time. Welcome. <laughs> we are happy you're here. I will say that it's not normal for the heat to be quite so extreme in mid-June. So I apologize for that. Um, but I thought I might share a few interesting facts and, you know, whether you came in today or yesterday, um, hopefully you'll, you'll have an opportunity to check out the, the city at least a little bit. Um, the Great Salt Lake is the largest salt lake found in the Western Hemisphere, has an average depth of 14 feet with a maximum depth of 33 feet. And it's also the fourth largest lake in the world that doesn't flow into other some some other type of water system. It's, it's why it's a salty lake is because it doesn't have an outlet. Um, it, there's also been a lot of news in the last uh, handful of years as Salt Lake City has been experiencing extreme drought conditions about what would happen if the lake were to dry up. So if you're ever interested, Google it. The good news is we've had a couple of really good water years and it's, it's uh, refilling a bit. Uh, one of the things that I think Salt Lake is known for is uh, being the, the home of a lot of people who uh, are in the, the uh, Mormon religion. Uh, the Family History Library, which is just a couple of blocks away, is the largest genealogical library in the world. Uh, so if it's ever something you're interested in exploring, uh, there are always people there happy to help you. And speaking of uh, the Mormon church or LDS church, um, the building that is just north of here, if you go out of the hotel, surrounded by uh, scaffolding is the, uh, the temple that was built back in the 1800s, uh, it took over 40 years to build. And so that's probably explaining why it needs a lot of uh, reinforcement these days. Also, uh, something you may not know is that the world's first Kentucky Fried Chicken was opened in 1952 here in Salt Lake City. Yeah, not Kentucky. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, but Colonel Sanders franchised the chicken recipe to a friend based in Utah, and he named his restaurant Kentucky Fried Chicken after the massive interest in the menu item. Uh, uh, ZCMI was also uh, formed in 1868, and it was the, the country's first department store it was here in Salt Lake City doesn't exist. It was purchased by Macy's a few years ago, but uh, dates back to the 1800s. Kraft Foods has announced that Salt Lake City has the highest jello consumption per capita. <laughs> so next time you're at the supermarket, you know, think of Salt Lake, pick up a box of jello. Um, the nation's first transcontinental railroad was completed in Utah. Uh, the Golden Spike Monument is uh, about an hour north of here in Promontory. And on uh, May 10th each year, they do an annual reenactment and, and celebrate that. In addition to these interesting facts and others, Utah is also home to just spectacular outdoor activities, uh, skiing, hiking, and five national parks. So even if you don't have time on this trip, hopefully you'll have, have an opportunity to come back at some point. Uh, so Mark gave you a little bit of information about WEC. Um, WEC is what we call the uh, regional entity for the Western Interconnection. And we perform that work in collaboration with NERC and under delegated authority from FERC 
um, with the objective of assuring the reliability and security of the Western interconnection. Uh, the Western interconnection contains all or part of 14 Western states, the Canadian provinces of British Columbia and Alberta, and a small portion of Mexico uh, down just below California. So we are based in Salt Lake City, although much of our staff is now uh, working remotely thanks to the pandemic and uh, allowed us an opportunity to expand our workforce and, and really be able to uh, hire the best and brightest to work with us. So WEC, formerly, formerly known as WSCC, for those of you who may have heard uh, of us before, was formed in 1967 after the Northeast blackout of 1965. Um, the years leading up to that blackout, uh, our, our country was really enjoying the benefits that came from electric appliances and air conditioning and all of the technologies and comforts of life that that electricity brought. So that blackout highlighted the need for mo more focus on how do we uh, work together to plan, design, and operate the interconnection. So in 1967, WSCC was formed and uh, later became WEC in, in 2002. So another fun fact, um, if you look to the east, and when I say to the east, that's toward the mountains, um, there's a beautiful college campus of the University of Utah. And um, the reason that WEC is in Salt Lake and WSCC before it is actually because of the University of Utah. Back in the late 60s, the, the organization had a need to run computer simulations of the interconnection. And one of the few places that had a supercomputer big enough to do that was the University of Utah. We actually have uh, a couple of engineers remaining on our staff, although uh, one will retire this week after 42 years with WEC. Uh, but he tells the story and he still has some of the computer cards that they used to march over to the campus at the end of the day and put their cards so they could run the simulation and, and check the results the next morning. He uh, always likes to tell the story that you didn't wanna drop them on your way to the university because it made for a, a really bad day. Um, in addition to the work that WEC does to monitor uh, the, the mandatory compliance or compliance with the mandatory standards that we now have in our country, WEC is responsible for several activities that are aimed at promoting reliability and uh, resilience of the system here in the Western interconnection. We partner with industry stakeholders through technical committees, uh, similar to what you have here with ESIG and are able to perform assessments and modeling and do uh, work such as event analysis. If there's been a disruption on the grid, um, our team works with the affected entities to uh, do a root cause analysis and understand the impact of that event. And I also identify corrective measures. We have a role in situation awareness where we work with the region's reliability coordinators to understand real-time operating conditions on the grid uh, we have an, a group that focuses on power system risk analysis and also builds models, uh, including the base cases that are used to study the Western interconnection. We perform forward-looking reliability assessments, trying to understand um, what the system will, will look like and will it be reliable and resilient in the 10, and increasingly we're looking at the, the year 20 timeframe. Um, and as I said earlier, we do all of that in partnership with our technical committees that are comprised of uh, technical experts in the utilities um, from the West. So turning a little bit to the broad picture of reliability and, and what we are focused on at WEC, um, as, as you all know, and, and as I'm sure you're studying on a daily basis, uh, there's a large number of risks facing the interconnection as we transform the grid from what it has been to what it will be in the future. Um, I thought I'd provide a, a few data points from the uh, NERC summer assessment where we're looking at reliability forecasts for this summer, and then also from the longer term reliability assessment. Uh, so first let's start with the summer outlook. Uh, we do this in partnership with NERC, and the good news is that um, the analysis shows that on an um, expected condition, which is the one in two kind of day, we're expecting to have adequate resources to meet the, the needs of reliability this summer. 
um, the challenges come in extreme scenarios. And as we look at widespread heat events and things that we've had in the past few years, starting to recognize that um, a normal year doesn't look normal like it's always looked in the past. I, I know many of you were involved in a uh, weather data uh, uh, seminar this morning, so you know that better than I do. Uh, we're also learning that to maintain reliability in the years come, uh, coming, a massive amount of new resources are going to need to be built. So it's just one example. Uh, we collect data from all of our um, operating utilities in the Western interconnection, uh, looking at their loads and resource forecasts. And um, for this year, the data shows that the industry in the West between January and June, so the end of this month, we were expected to add 17 gigawatt of new resources, um, primarily wind, solar, and battery storage, as you might expect. Um, to put that in context, the all-time peak in the Western interconnection is uh, just over 168 gigawatts. So that's about 10% of our peak that we would be looking to add this year. We don't yet know how much has actually been added, but if we look at last year during the same period of time, um, we're finding that, that building resources is getting more challenging. So in the same period of time between January and June of 2023, the industry was planning to add 14 gigawatts of new resources and have them operational by the summer. Um, our data is showing that only about 5.5 gigawatts was added in that same time. So what we're seeing is the impact of supply chain and um, resource issues that things aren't always coming online as, as early as they were planned. Um, a little bit of good news is that they caught up a bit uh, last year, but even at that, only a little over half of what was planned for 2023 actually came online by the end of the year. So it highlights a, an increasing challenge that, that the industry is going to have um, to, to make sure that we can sustain reliability. Um, recognizing some of the delays in building new resources, we're seeing that industry is delaying some retirements. Uh, we've seen in our data collection that about five gigawatts of resources, um, these are traditional resources, uh, coal, nuclear, uh, gas, those types of things, they're being delayed out beyond 2025. So the good news is in the near term, the reliability picture looks better because those resources are available um, the challenge is we're just kicking the can down the road because eventually those resources will retire. And now we're seeing pretty massive uh, retirements looking out four, five, or six years into the future. So I think the message there is that industry is going to need to keep their foot on the pedal and, and make sure that, that we continue to build at a, a fairly rapid pace. So as we look to the longer term assessments for the West, um, we're seeing that low probability, high impact, extreme weather events are really uh, starting to become one of our biggest threats to reliability. Um, over the last few years in the West in particular, we've seen um, wide uh, expanse and long duration heat events. In the same years, we've seen cold events where uh, they had widespread impact we are learning new terms all the time from our local forecasters about atmospheric rivers and exceptional droughts, um, wildfires, floods, and other weather phenomena that are affecting reliability. Um, all of this is happening at a time when we're seeing massive amounts of new load come onto the system. Um, challenged by data centers, AI. Uh, Mark had some great statistics about the impact of AI um, I was speaking with a utility executive just a couple of weeks ago, and he was mentioning that they have a data center request in their queue that's looking for 3.8 gigawatt of power. That is almost enough to use the entire Palo Verde nuclear plant located in Arizona all by itself. Yet that plant is you know, pretty much fully used to serve current load. So when you multiply that by all of the utilities who have similar things in their queue, it becomes a really concerning reliability problem. Uh, clearly, advanced forecasting techniques will become more and more important to assure that the resource and transmission analyses are helping us to design a system that will assure reliability and resilience in the future. 
Uh, turning a little bit to what WEC is doing to help support reliability in these areas. And tomorrow we'll be asking our WEC board of directors to approve what we call our reliability risk priorities. These are five priorities that have been developed in close collaboration with our Western stakeholders and are intended to reflect the unique reliability risks, risks that we experience here in the Western section or um, those that maybe have a unique opportunity for WEC to contribute. We do this building on the work that NERC does with their um, risk report where they identify broad risks to reliability. Um, I'll, I'll share the, the five that we're going into and, and have a couple of questions in each area because frankly, we've identified the risks, we don't have the answers. So part of the, the role of WEC is to collaborate with industry all of you uh, to be able to identify the answers. So the first one is eridification, which is another term that wasn't in my vocabulary a couple of years ago. Uh, but eridification and the associated natural events, uh, drought, heat, and wildfire that we're experiencing here in the West. Uh, one of the key questions we have to answer is what are the long-term effects of a reduction in hydro capacity across the interconnection particularly in areas such as the Pacific Northwest who have been largely dependent on hydro. Another question is, with the past no longer a dependable predictor of the future weather patterns, how can system planning better account for unpredictable weather? weather? Boy, words are hard today. Um, and then we need to look at what improvements are needed to be made to the models and, and forecasting systems that, that we use um, the the carry-on implication to that would be, are there changes to the standards that might help in assuring reliability? Uh, the second major risk priority is understanding and assessing the impact of inverter-based resources. Uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. As you look at the adoption of inverter-based resources across the Western interconnection, I think we're kind of a learning laboratory with a lot of uh, advancements in particular in California. But I think a, a relevant question probably for this audience, and I'm sure something you're studying, is what kinds of data and modeling are necessary to accurately study the potential effects of these inverter-based resources on stability in the 10 and 20 year timeframe? Um, we're asking ourselves as the interconnection-wide model builder, what can WEC do to ensure that we have the right data and models being built for the use of industry? It, it is notable that uh, the one of the first known um, reliability impacts of inverter-based resources happened in 2017 with the Blue Cut Fire event. And um, what's that, seven years since, we are still seeing outages with the same root causes as that event. So are we adopting fast enough and, and implementing solutions once they're identified? Uh, the third major risk priority is lack of coordinated planning for building out resources and transmission. That one sort of seems like a no-brainer, but as you look at our interconnection and the way we, we're currently structured, um, there's, there's generation being built where there isn't transmission and you have transmission where maybe there wouldn't be generation in the future if we can somehow harmonize those processes in a way to ensure that the investments that are being made are the ones that are going to best serve reliability. Um, so we're working with many of our partners to uh, contribute to a study uh, through West Tech to try and identify, is there a, a more comprehensive way to do interconnection-wide coordinated system planning? Uh, the fourth risk priority is model quality and data and input validation. Um, we need to take a serious look at what does the interconnection need to do to improve the quality of inverter-based resource modeling. Um, how can we model them quickly? How can they be improved? Um, how can our demand forecasts be improved to account for the variability in, in both the load as well as the resources as they're being put on the system? And finally, the last risk uh, priority is understanding the potential effects of energy policies in the West. Um, the West is unique from the standpoint of we have very diverse policies across those 14 Western states, can Canadian provinces, uh, with the coastal states of Oregon, Washington, and California being um, more progressive in terms of adoption of um, 
wind and solar and having very aggressive uh, clean energy goals and the interior states being less aggressive in those things. And in fact, sometimes really resisting um, making changes. Uh, as an example, the Utah legislature this year passed some legislation that will keep the, the coal plants located in central Utah operating uh, for longer than, than was otherwise planned. So all of that's happening in a time when we have federal legislation uh, or federal rules coming out of organizations such as the EPA. So it creates a very um, challenging uh, environment in which to try and assure the reliability of the interconnected system. Uh, so these are the, the priority focus areas for WEC. Um, we also have a whole bunch of other things that we do, which I, I talked about earlier. Um, and, and all of those are, are meant to contribute to what are the, the most urgent needs for reliability and how can WEC marshal its resources to best contribute to that long-term. So I'm encouraged. I've looked ahead to your agenda and it looks like you have a fantastic agenda over the next three days. I wish I could stay, but I can guarantee you I'd probably get lost in the first five minutes. So I'm really glad you're all here and working on all of these things. Um, I'm excited to hear about your conversations related to AI. Uh, there are lots of uh, possibilities and opportunities. And at the same time, they have to be deployed in, in using caution. Um, one of the risks I didn't talk about specifically, but that we talk about often is the cybersecurity risks that, that are ever present. And we could have a whole conversation about that. So I've talked a lot and now I'm gonna get back to inventing the future. Um, it's a little bit of context and backdrop, uh, but the topic at hand of inventing the future is, is one that I've really come to appreciate. And it's all about mindsets and how we think of, of the challenges we're dealing with. So there's a business book called The Three Laws of Performance, where authors Steve Zafron and Dave Logan introduce the concept that really has changed the way I think about the future and how I and the company that I uh, lead can impact what happens in the future. The book introduces two terms. One is the default future and the other is the invented future. So by default future, it doesn't mean the inevitable default future that, that we often joke about of you know, birth, taxes, aging, and death, right? That, that is probably a default future, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, in this way of thinking, the default future is characterized by our expectations, our fears, our hopes, our predictions, all of which are ultimately based on our experiences of the past. It describes the future that is likely to happen absent any intentional action. And for most people, the default future is often one that we don't want to choose. On the other hand, the invented future is characterized by possibility and opportunity that comes from a blank space, one that hasn't been written yet. Changing our mindsets and the words we use to describe the future allows us to essentially invent a future that is better than the one we would get by default. It's an interesting concept, it takes a bit to wrap your head around because I think probably most of us in this room are very linear thinkers. We were either born that way or we were trained to be that way by being engineers or lawyers or economists or accountants, right? We're trained to use the past as the best predictor of the future. This concept is, is sort of throwing that out the window and saying, let's invent a future that we would all love and then figure out how we get there. Not by dragging what we know of the past, but by inventing new things unconstrained from, from the past. So I found one example from the book that sort of illustrates this. Um, Benjamin Franklin is often credited with having invented the word American and in doing so transforming 13 warring colonies into a nation. His words displaced what most political analysts of the day predicted was inevitable, which was that the colonies would never speak with one voice. As the words took root in the consciousness, people found themselves drawn into a new future and began taking actions that were consistent with that future. The most notable being the Declaration of Independence and the rest is history, as you can say. But for a moment, contrast that declaration of independence with what would have happened if they produced a document titled 
description of independence or thoughts about independence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not quite as committed to that future as, as you are with the declaration. So for me, I found that this distinction between the default future and the invented future to be an apt description of what we're experiencing as an industry. We're in the midst of a massive transformation, moving from the grid built by our grandfathers to building a grid that our grandchildren will inherit. And the question is really, what kind of a future do we want that to be? So I will stop there. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you and uh, I think it's going over to Mark. A pleasure. And uh, let's give her, a hand, Melanie, a hand for a great presentation. Next, I'm going to uh, call up Charlie Smith, the executive director of ESIG, to give us his industry overview. Charlie. Thank you, Mark. I was thinking as Mark was describing some of the early uh, or the, the early history of this workshop about the state of wind forecasting back in those days. Now, I remember visiting one of the early wind plants. It was probably back in the 08, 09 kind of time period. And uh, the, the operator had a about a 100 megawatt plant and he got a forecast every day. And we were curious, you know, it was part of the O&M user group at that time. Here's what he did with his forecast. And he said, well, I get this, uh, this sheet of paper every day on my fax machine. He said, I take it, I look at it, and then I go like this, and then I throw it in the trash can. <laughs> so that was the state of the art of uh, wind forecasting back in 2018, uh, 2008. But we've come a long way since 2008. That's, that's good to see. Okay, first I have to give a little bit of uh, disclaimer and antitrust compliance. So the disclaimer is, don't believe anything that you hear here and only half of what you see, okay? <laughs> and the antitrust guideline is uh, obey the law. We, we don't uh, do it, take part in any uh, restraint of competition. We don't price discriminate or no division of markets, none of that allocation of production imposition of boycotts, none of that bad stuff. We don't do any of those bad things here. And on a more serious note, the uh, non-discrimination and anti-harassment policies. ESIG does not tolerate discrimination or harassment in any way, shape, or form. And we do not discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, gender expression, age, national origin, disability, marital status, sexual orientation, or military status in any of our activities and operations. We welcome all people of all backgrounds to participate in our activities, and we don't tolerate any form of harassment in any way, shape, or form. And harassment is any verbal remark, physical advance, or visual display that makes another feel intimidated, offended, or belittled. So just uh, want everybody to remember that and just be polite and uh, make sure that all of your comments are appropriate and respectful. Thank you for that. Okay, just a little bit of overview of the agenda. We had a, a great tutorial this morning on, on weather data sets, a lot of really good stuff going on that I think will be useful to people who are in search of that kind of information. We're in our introduction and keynote session here now, followed by an opening plenary session that Mark gave a little bit of overview on with AI applications to forecasting and markets. Then tomorrow morning, uh, four sessions are going to be parallel on Wednesday, so we'll actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sessions covering all different aspects of forecasting and market design and operation, improving DER participation and organized markets in parallel with the growth of large loads, uh, first sessions in the morning, considerations of 100% zero marginal cost markets, which my good friend Paul Stakevich doesn't really like to talk about because he doesn't think they're really going to happen, but he'll tell you about that tomorrow. And then advances in wind and solar forecasting. And then in the afternoon, session on retail pricing, and parallel with power system impacts of rapid electrification, and then wrapping up the day with forecasting and markets, and a parallel session on utility and ISO probabilistic forecasting developments, followed by the networking reception at 6.30.
tomorrow evening and then Thursday morning. A session co-sponsored with the Renewable Energy Committee of the American Meteorological Society, or AMS, on bridging the gap between atmospheric science and grid modeling. And then a closing plenary session on panel discussion of the issues and challenges in the energy transition, and particularly in the area of forecasting and markets that we'll be talking about for the next two days. So just a little bit about the, uh, the context, the environment for the, the workshop really for everything that's going on today. I presented this slide at the fall technical workshop in October. It was a slide that I got uh, in September. It shows the average temperatures um, from 2000, or 1991 to 2022. And it looks at the uh, monthly average temperatures for those years over that period of time, those light gray lines in the background compared to the 1991 to 2020 average. And you can see the 2023 line going up to 0.9 degrees C warmer than the average over that period of time with uh, comments in the press like absolutely gobsmackingly bananas, extraordinary, you know, very technical language used to describe what was going on, but <laughs> that's, that's what was going on. With Copernicus, <coughs> Copernicus estimates from Europe, uh, Estimates that the annual average temperatures are expected to end up about 1.4 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. And you all know the 1.5 degree uh, kind of number that's the kind of warning point from the IPC estimates, uh, studies that have been done. So now uh, this, this slide, global surface temperature increase above the pre-industrial level, it was... Uh, put out just a little bit ago. You see the uh, five-year rolling average on the left-hand side from 1850 to 2020-ish, hovering around zero degrees above uh, average, up, getting up to the 1.2 degrees for the five-year rolling average in the, around the 2020 time period. And then you see the actual annual averages on the right-hand side, 2023, the last full year data. It's just about 1.4 degrees C. And then if you've been watching the news in the last couple of months, I think in uh, January or February, the, uh, the five-year average for the last 12 months in January or February was just over 1.5 degrees C. And then last month in May, the next data point came out for the last 12 months through May of 2024 with like 1.62 degrees C. So we've hit the 1.5 degrees C uh, for 12, 12 months on a couple of occasions now for the last few years. So that's, I think that's a warning point that uh, people are, are taking note of. What to do? If anybody knows me and my great prowess with computer technology, maybe if I unplug it and plug it in again, I'll fix this mess. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, unplugging and plugging that's got to be done. So I, I like to review the results of the uh, Lazard Consulting uh, Annual Levelized Cost of Energy Report just to see where things are going or how they're going. So every year, Lazard, which was an investment banker, looks at the uh, levelized cost of energy in different regions around the country using a standardized set of assumptions. And you can quibble with the assumptions. But the nice thing about them is that they're comparing apples to apples. They're not comparing apples to oranges. It's the same a consistent set of assumptions. I'm just going to pick out a couple of uh, numbers here to look at. You see two vertical lines, one for gas combined cycle, around $40 a megawatt hour, and one for gas peaking plants, around $115 a megawatt hour. And then you see for a number of different generation options, an unsubsidized cost of energy in a black line, and just below that, a subsidized cost of energy, reflecting the various ITC, PTCs that are available. So they're arranged in sets of two going down. I'm just going to pick out a couple. I'll pick out the uh, solar PV utility scale, the third set of bars down there. I'm just going to look at the, the lowest uh, levelized cost of energy. You can see the range of the numbers. But unsubsidized utility scale solar down around $24 megawatt hour. And you get in the subsidized regime, you're getting down into the $16 a megawatt hour, lowest levelized cost of energy somewhere in the US. 
under these set of assumptions. And, and it bears reality. You can find projects that, that meet those estimates. Solar PV with storage, utility scale, $46 a megawatt hour, unsubsidized, $30 a megawatt hour, subsidized. And then wind onshore, $24 a megawatt hour, subsidized and getting down to very low numbers with the uh, subsidized case. This is really what's behind the rapid development of wind and solar capacity across the country and around the world. It's driven by economics and the economics are overwhelming. There's no denying the economics. There's no turning back from the way we're going. So everybody is working to make this system work the best that it can to achieve the goals that society has to decarbonize itself by 2050. A couple of uh, trend curves from the Lazard data. This shows the unsubsidized wind cost of energy, levelized cost of energy over time. You can see going back to the 2009 time period, the bars again represent the high and the low. This is on the unsubsidized though, but the low end from back around $100 a megawatt hour back in the 2010 time period to 26 to $24 a megawatt hour uh, last year. There's a little bit of um, in fact, they didn't publish the report for a year just after COVID. There was disruption of the supply chain. There was the high inflation, and they couldn't really get a good set of numbers then. But you can see that the downward trend is still going down, but there's also at the high end, a big jump in the high end of the projects because of those problems that, that occurred at that time. Unsubsidized solar, the same kind of thing. Back in the $300 megawatt hour range, back in the 20, 2010 300 down to $200 a megawatt hour. And that also going down to 30 and then $24 a megawatt hour in the 2021, 2023 period, but also with a jump in the high end of those projects. But the overall trend still is going down. I think people believe that it will continue to go down. There's just uh, tremendous cost reductions that are coming out of the learning curve of the manufacturing and the installation experience. Hydrogen, it's a relatively new um, resource that's being tracked. Has a lot of hope, a lot of potential for the future, especially for long-term storage. So this is a, uh, a chart talking about green hydrogen. And again, you can see the black bar, that's an unsubsidized cost of green hydrogen. And below it, a, a gray bar, which is a subsidized cost with the subsidies that are available. The uh, the footnote there just kind of gives a benchmark with the cost of green hydrogen as a result of the uh, the DOE hydrogen shot program, which seeks to achieve a, a number going from five to one dollar per kilogram, and a dollar per kilogram is around eight dollar a million BTU by 2030, which is competitive with fossil fuel sources of hydrogen. The two bars on the top are for the proton exchange membrane technology. Two bars on the bottom are for the alkaline technology. You can see today we're in the uh, four or five to seven or eight dollars per kilogram range with the PEM technology, with the subsidies a dollar sixty-eight to four twenty-eight per kilogram, and then with the uh, alkaline technology, three to six dollars a kilogram, for the unsubsidized cost going down to less than one dollar. To 283 per kilogram. There's there's a lot of assumptions or a lot of numbers that go into the calculation that depend on the the way the U.S. Um, I guess it's the Department of Treasury rules for the hydrogen subsidies go, but I don't remember the details of the assumptions for the subsidies for this calculation. But it certainly indic indicates the uh, trend, the direction things are going for hydrogen, and if the DOE research program is anywhere near as successful as the PV program has been in the last 10 years. Um, I think you can expect these, these kinds of numbers towards the end of the decade. If you, if you look at the, the history of, of the wind, the solar, the batteries, now hydrogen, we've been looking at going back to the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, first wind going down by over a factor of 10 in cost, then solar going down by a factor of 10, then batteries going down by a factor of 10 or, or more, and, and now uh, hydrogen next up. So 
I think there's a lot of people that said it couldn't be done, couldn't be done for wind. It was always going to be a curiosity. Couldn't be done for solar. Couldn't be done for batteries. And a lot of people saying it can't be done for hydrogen. But I would uh, advise you to keep your eyes open and stay on the lookout. Next era energy projections. Next era is the largest renewable energy developer in the country. A couple of uh, interesting data points there from projections that have been made at their annual meetings over the years. Uh, from 2022, late this decade, with the IRA, NextEra expects wind coupled with a four hour battery system will cost $14 a megawatt hour to $21 a megawatt hour. We're just about there. Solar with batteries, $17 to $24 a megawatt hour, just about there as well. Existing natural gas fired power plants, $35 to $47 a megawatt hour. Just saw the $40 number on the on the charts, assuming gas is in the four dollars a million BTU to five five dollars a million BTU. So I think their view of where the economics are heading are pretty much right on, and that's the direction things are going. And as a indication of their their belief in those numbers, uh, they plan to double their operating fleet to sixty four gigawatts by the end of twenty twenty six. So big growth plans, betting on continuation of the trends we've been seeing. Globally, I used to be able to find individual numbers that I had some, some faith in for what the installed capacity of wind and solar were around the world, around the country, but I can't find any single number source anymore. So I go kind of poking around, looking at a number of different sources, but uh, into 2023, what I could find from global wind capacity, somewhere north of a thousand gigawatts, global PV capacity, somewhere as close to 1500 gigawatts. In the U.S., wind somewhere around 150 gigawatts, PV somewhere around 160 gigawatts. So it's just very recently PV uh, passed wind in the uh, installed capacity in the U.S. And then estimates for global installations this year, wind somewhere north of 100 gigawatts, PV somewhere north of 250 gigawatts. So it's real, it's here, and it ain't going away. In the US, not much has changed in the last couple of years. When you look at just numbers from the EIA, where we get our energy from, is about 20% of our energy comes from renewables, 20% comes from nuclear, 20% coal, and about 40% comes from natural gas. And the, uh, the renewables are slowly going up. The nuclear is pretty flat, coal is coming down, and natural gas is kind of flat to coming down a little bit takes a long time to move those numbers. The outlook for the future for the US wind plant installations, these are from uh, various sources put together by the ACP. Over the next couple of years, you see wind going from about 10 to 20 gigawatts per year installation in the US. Similarly for solar, interesting comparison here before and after the IRA. Uh, prior to the passage of the IRA, you see that green line, they're looking at something like 15 to probably 30-ish gigawatts per year after the IRA, looking at something like uh, 25 to probably 45, 50 gigawatts per year. So that the IRA definitely made a big impact, and the plans for the U.S. are also very large, large, but still... Uh, a lot more required to meet meet the goals of decarbonizing society. You've probably seen this this curve, of these uh, graphs before from LBNL. Every year they put out a state of the interconnection report. On the left hand side, on the far left, you see two bars. It's the uh, installed capacity in 2010 versus the Q in 2010, and then just to the right of that, for 2023, the installed capacity in 2023 versus the Q in 2023. So this install capacity, US 2010, about 1,000 gigawatts, 2023, about 12, 1,300 gigawatts. But the Q in 2010 was less than half the installed capacity, and most of it was wind at the time, a little bit of solar, a little bit of gas. You look at the Q today, the Q is twice the size of the installed capacity, and it's mostly solar, batteries, and wind, very little gas or whatever else that is down at the bottom. On the right-hand side, the gray bar in the background, 
is the Q. It's the uh, stack bars are seven, the seven major ISOs. And you can see that the Q is greater than the installed capacity in every one of the, the ISOs. And then the red line, it's a, a new addition, I think, you know, put in the curves this year. The approximated uh, peak load contribution of projects to the Q, this is according to a, a uh, effective load carrying capability analysis from, from NERC. And it's interesting that the, uh, the Q capacity is actually for all of the ISOs got more capacity in the Q than the uh, ELCC contribution required. Not, not to say that that's you know, the definitive metric for the particular ISO, but it's a, an interesting indication of where things are at and the Q greater than the peak load and the installed capacity in all the ISOs as well. So to the question about transmission. <laughs> yeah, transmission is the, the big difference and the big bottleneck in getting a lot of this capacity built. The uh, National Interest to Transmission Corridors study has recently been completed. I just thought it was interesting where those corridors were. If you've seen any of the graphs this morning of where the, the wind resources are and some of the solar resources in the Southwest, the big transmission uh, interest corridors up the Midwest there, upper Midwest and lower Midwest, a little bit out in the, uh, the far West, the mountain Northwest, and then a few corridors in the Mid Atlantic and New York and New England. So what's the buzz this past year? What's What's been going on in the news? Uh, again, the IRA, the impact of the IRA. For every dollar uh, from the IRA is matched by five and a half dollars in the private sector. So the IRA has really been a, a real lever on breaking loose private sector investment in renewable energy technology. And in spite of the, the size of the growth that's going place, global energy transition investment must quadruple the five trillion a year to meet climate targets. So we've got to put in three or four times as much capacity, renewable capacity as we've been putting in to get to the decarbonization goal of zero carbon emission by, by 2050. We heard a little bit about uh, the impact of AI from a, a couple of uh, comments that both Mark and other, other folks have made. This was from a Washington Post headline of March in 2024. AI and the boom in clean tech manufacturing are pushing America's power grid to the brink. Utilities can't keep up. Yeah, a little bit of a uh, sensational headline, but there's an element of truth in it. The, uh, the rate of growth of the data center load is just incredible. It's, it's hard to believe. On the, on the uh, electrification for residential and, and commercial front, four pump manufacturers developed successful sub-zero prototypes this is from the DOE Residential Cold Climate Heat Pump Challenge. Lennox, Carrier, Train, and Ream. I had a, a heat pump, my, one of my first houses going back to the 70s. And the uh, coefficient of performance was such that someplace above freezing, probably up around 35 or so, the resistance heaters would kick in. And now imagine buying a new heat pump where the resistance heaters don't kick in until you're down around zero. I think uh, Nick Miller and... And Debbie are going to tell us a little bit about that a little later, what happens. Um, big grid forming battery from Plus Power started operating 185 megawatts, 565 megawatt hours in Oahu, Hawaii. Hawaii has really been a leader in grid forming technology. A couple of Tesla VPPs cleared to provide energy to ERCOT. David Maggio will be telling us a little bit more about that in the next day or two. Big... DOE, uh, $7 billion for seven hydrogen hubs. So they're already thinking about the transition to the um, commercialization of, of hydrogen. EV impacts, suffice it to say that they could be very big if the uh, EVs are not part of some kind of a uh, managed, either a price responsive load management program or some kind of control program. Other items in the news kind of surprised Scotland it was the uh, first government globally to declare a climate emergency and they just abandoned their 20, 2030 climate goals, which were reducing greenhouse gases by 75% by 2030, citing credibility concerns. The uh, press voted bitterly disappointing from the, uh, the Scottish uh, prime minister. 
but it's it's a sign of the difficulty of achieving the goals that have been set. Society sets goals, but goals have to be met, be met by engineering development and by economics, economic development. And it's uh, a big a big journey from setting a goal to achieving it in something like the electric system. We're talking about a system that has changes that take place over decades, not over years. And people are looking for changes to take place in years. And it's a really heavy lift to compress the time scale from decades to years. AI's voracious need for computing power is threatening to overwhelm energy sources, requiring the industry to change its approach to the technology. And, and certainly there are efficiency improvements on the horizon. From Bloomberg, by 2030, the world's data centers are on course to use more electricity than India, the world's most popular, populous country. AEP testifies to 108 gigawatts of load seeking to connect to their 11 state system. And a lot of that was large load. AEP is kind of the heartland of the country, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, um, Michigan, right there in the middle. Uh, talking with a friend from Texas a little bit ago, Texas has applications for 50 gigawatts of data center load in the next 10 years. Er ERCOT is an 80 gigawatt system. 50 gigawatts of data center load in the next 10 years. Pretty big number. It's not all going to happen, of course, but just give you some sense of the uh, the appetite out there. Maryland, first U.S. state to pass vehicle to grid legislation. There's going to be an awful lot of battery capacity running around in electric vehicles. It'd be nice to be able to use that sometime in the future. Oh, I, I, I wanted to mention... FERC Order 1920, I think that's been mentioned before today too, but Interregional Transmission Planning just came out last month, May of 24. I think there's a lot of uh, hope writing on FERC Order 1920 that will encourage the construction of interregional transmission that will improve the resilience and also enable the interconnection of more renewable capacity. I want to mention just a, uh, a word about the uh, expansion of ESIG and its activities. The, the work of ESIG is done through our working groups, and we have five five working groups, the System Planning Working Group, the System Operations and Market Design Working Group, the DER Working Group, the Reliability Working Group, and the Education Working Group. And they all have a number of task forces or project teams that are working with them. Uh, this expansion of activities has been enabled by increased membership, by increased support from DOE, by increased foundation support, there's a lot of work going on in these areas, and this is really the way the work of ESIG gets done. This is where things happen. This is where the members participate and collaborate. And uh, encourage you, if you are interested in any of these activities, to take a look and consider participating in them. In addition to the working groups, there's three user groups, one on operations and maintenance, one on GETS, uh, Grid Enhancing Technologies, and one on probabilistic forecasts. In planning and operations, the probabilistic forecasting uh, user group met yesterday. It's a, again, a members only group of members who are using the technology. I was able to uh, sit in on, on part of it and the things that are going on, the uh, things that you will be talking about here today and then the applications of those the probabilistic forecast, planning and operations. It's really, really gratifying and fascinating to see what, uh, what's happening there. Upcoming meetings, our uh, fall meeting is going to be in Providence, Rhode Island, the week of October 21. The uh, spring meeting is not going to be in Tucson. The next year is going to be in Austin, Texas, in the week of March 17th. And the forecasting and markets workshop is not going to be in Denver or Salt Lake City next year. It's going to be in Nashville, Tennessee. So come back to Nashville, Tennessee next year for this, uh, this workshop. And... Uh, I also wanted to mention the IEEE Power and Energy Magazine. ESIG staff participates as guest editors of the magazine for probably an issue every year or two. And this uh, issue on inverter-based resources, which we've also heard about today, is available out on the on the uh, desk. Julia, who's not here today, is uh, one of the guest editors on this magazine. It's, it's a good read. I want to welcome all of our guests from around the world, uh, Australia, Canada, Germany, Japan, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, and do we have any here from Texas? 
Anybody from, oh, there's somebody from Texas. Oh, a couple people from Texas. Okay, let's hear it for Texas. So <clears throat> welcome to all of you from, from far away places. Anybody that's from outside the US, just raise your hand. Just go ahead, put your, put your hand up. I, I'd like to let you know that we're a friendly bunch here. There's gonna be lots of opportunities at the breaks, at the meals, at the reception, to meet people, to talk to people. Please take the opportunity to do that. I think you'll have a good time and glad that you're here and hope that you'll be back again. Thank you. Thank you.